This is the Brewer to Brewer podcast from All About Beer, a conversation that goes beyond the brew house and into topics that matter to brewing professionals and curious beer drink. Visit allaboutbeer.com and follow on social media. And to support journalism in the beer space, check out patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. I'm Sean Yasaki of Noble Beast Brewing in Cleveland, Ohio. And this week, I'm glad to be talking with my new friend, Eric Larkin of Cohesion Brewing. We'll get into it in just a moment, but first this message. First Tea is a proud sponsor of the Brewer to Brewer podcast. They've been working with brewers on a wide range of ingredients and delicious beers. First Tea combines the flexibility of order sizes with the experience you need to create innovative and successful tea beers. They get you the most direct from farm tea selection, so you are working with flavorful and consistent products. You can find more about First Tea's collaborations with brewers and tea ingredients by visiting blog.firsttea.com. That's blog.firsttea.com. So, Eric, um, this is a little uh, different from the other podcasts because we really don't know each other. Yeah. Uh, So this is, um, we were connected by uh, somebody I think you worked with in the past and he popped into my brewery. And I don't, I don't think Dan's ever actually worked in uh, the brewing industry, but he did help me install all of my tanks here for about the 16 hour day that that was. So we're, we're friends at this point. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah. I was showing him around and, you know, we started talking about, you know, our cereal cooker and decoctions and stuff. And then you came up and uh, we kind of connected over text message briefly, but instead of um, interviewing, you know, a friend, uh, I thought, Hey, let's, uh, Maybe I'll take this opportunity and make a new friend. And I think the world of uh, cereal cooker owners and whatnot is fairly small. So I'm always like really curious and interested to, to meet people that are kind of playing around with the same things. Um, so I have uh, quickly five questions for you here that will okay. define you. Everyone will be able to understand <laughs> what kind of man you are by these very brief answers. So just All right. Right off the top of your head, go. Uh, Cats or dogs? Uh, dogs. Bud Light or Miller Light? Miller Light. Elton John or Billy Joel? Mm. Uh, probably Elton John. Apple or Android? Apple. And what is the hardest beer style to brew? Oh, boy. Uh, probably... Uh, Lambic Goose styles, method traditional style, style stuff. It just takes so much patience that, I mean, I have some patience as a lager brewer, but not not years like that. So, all right, you aced all of those. Those are all 100 percent correct. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. So let's kind of get into this here. Um, before we dive into brewery stuff and you know brewing, um, just give us a quick little bio about yourself. You know. What are you into yeah. outside of the brewing world? Like, who is Eric Larkin? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I've been in brewing pretty much my whole professional life, but um, have obviously done a number of things outside of it. Um, we're in we're in Colorado, which we just got our first uh, bit of snow yesterday, which is exciting because that's really what <laughs> the reason I moved to Colorado was for the, the skiing. Uh, my wife's a snowboarder, so, you know, my my some of my yearly success in my own head is defined by number of ski days I've gotten that year uh, with my personal record is about 45. So I'm, I'm shooting oh, for wow. above, above 20 this year, obviously opening a brewery last year. Um, and then also not having a bar manager during the winter last year kind of slowed me down, but uh, we're staffed up. We're ready to go. I bought some new boots uh, this week, so I'm, <laughs> I'm ready to get back into, into skiing this year. Um, I love getting outside. I mean, I feel like a lot of people uh, moved to Colorado for that access to nature. Um, but then, yeah, um, spend a lot of time at home with my wife and my dog. Um, love cooking, love, you know, getting into food like a lot of a lot of brewers do. So, um, yeah, so that's that's kind of why we're why we're in Colorado. And um, we've been, been where, where are you from or like where did you grow up? So I grew up in Dallas, um, just north of Dallas um, uh, at Went to college in Vermont, um, so wanted wanted something different. Um, getting out of uh, North Dallas, so uh, got a scholarship to a school in Vermont that figured to be about as different from Texas as I could get. Uh, so ended up 
in Vermont with what I thought was enough winter clothes, uh, but was <laughs> sorely mistaken. <laughs> pretty, pretty quickly learned how brutal the winters can be there. Um, my wife and I, I moved to Maine um, in 2012, I think. Yeah, 2012 about and um, lived there for about four years. Um, and then my wife and I met in Maine and then we she got relocated uh, not by choice to Arkansas. And I said, I don't really want to move to Arkansas. You know, not much in the way of skiing there. So we kind of settled on Colorado as a place to get back together. And uh, we've been here for about seven years now. So um, yeah, I've kind of been all over. Haven't really lived much on the West Coast, but definitely love traveling, getting out there. And that's kind of another big, you know, thing that we do and we love doing. And it's been a great way to explore beer and use beer to kind of explore places um, has really been something we've enjoyed since, since I could, could drink beer really. Uh. Cool. So you, you mentioned, um, you know, going to school in Vermont, was that brewing school? Was that? Yeah. So totally I went, different. I got a degree in biology. So just a four year uh, degree, but obviously Vermont in, you know, from 2006 to 2010 was one of the most populated places for craft beer still is, you know, in the country. So we were yeah. surrounded by it. Um, I definitely, you know, got education in beer, just like most people do in college in their own way, shape or form. But we were, you know, once we turned 21, we were going to Magic Cat and getting growlers. Uh, we were going, you know, buying the Wolliver's organic beers. Uh, they had a little, uh, you know, one of those brewery passports. So right after college, we tried to hit all the breweries, you know, and get the stamps. And then you got like, a pint glass at the end of it. It was a silly thing for all the work you did to drive around the state and go to all the breweries. But, you know, we would go, we'd go to Hill Farmstead. We'd go to uh, try and go to the farmer's market to get some Lawson's beers. So um, it was really fun to have such great beer around. And uh, I ended up, I did end up taking the Vermont or the American Brewers Guild class uh, with Steve Parks. So that was kind of the formal education, I guess I got. Um, but I got into brewing, so I started working on farms out of college. Um, I was interested in agriculture. You know, Vermont is a huge eat and drink local place. They love local things. They've always wanted to support producers uh, in their own state. Um, so I, I kind of caught that bug and was working on some small scale farms. Um, and then one of the farms I worked on uh, was the year that Hurricane Irene actually hit. It made it all the way up to Vermont. So it kind of went through New York and hit, hit all the way up into Vermont. And the farm I was on, their fields were flooded about six feet of water on these fields. Um, so we couldn't really plant any vegetables. Uh, season was kind of ruined. Um, I was home brewing at the time. I'd been home brewing for about two years. So I would bring in beers for us to drink during lunch or during you know harvest or just washing vegetables. Uh, so the owners of the farm, they said, you seem to like this beer stuff. You know, We get spent spring grain from a brewery in Burlington. Uh, we can't really pay you anything because we're not making anything. Uh, you want to try, you know, go see if they have some hours for you. Maybe you can work over there. Um, so I went to this little pub. Um, it's American Flatbread is the restaurant. It's where Zero Gravity, the brewery, started. It's now kind of expanded into its own beast. And the uh, American Flatbread Brewery is now sort of coming out of that pub. Um, so I worked, I basically volunteered for about a month, like 20 to 30 hours a week. And eventually I said to the head brewer, uh, Destiny is her name said, Hey, could I get paid sometime? And she said, we don't, we don't pay, we don't pay you yet. And I said, no, I haven't been paid yet. She's like, Oh yeah, we should, we should pay you. You're, you're helpful. So that was how I got my first brewing job. Um, and then while I was there, I got to sneak, you know, sneak in the line for the Brewers Guild class. Cause you had to have the, uh, in-person component to it. And that was the part that was backed up at that time. There wasn't uh, enough opportunities to go to breweries and see the processes. So because I was working at a brewery, I could do all the remote work on my own, but then go to breweries around the state or just learn, you know, what we did in our brewery. So um, got that. And then they were, you know, once I was kind of trained up, it wasn't really a two full-time person job, but I wanted to be full-time in brewing. So I'd ask them for full-time work and they said, you know, we don't really have it. Um, so I applied. The only brewery I have applied to at that time was Allagash in Maine. I loved their spontaneous program. I was enamored by the cool ship. You know, they were the first brewery in the U.S. to put in that cool ship and go for that Belgian style of production. Um, so I thought it'd be a cool place to work. Uh, so I applied there, never had been to Maine, drove over and 
they, they luckily hired me. Um, so I worked there for about four years. Um, and that was a really, really great experience. I can't say, you know, nice enough things about what I learned and, uh, how formative, you know, those years were for, uh, learning quality control, learning, uh, sensory programs, learning brewing practices, learning how important, you know, consistency can be. Um, but also learning from my own perspective, you know, what I did and did not want to do. So, you know, production brewing, I, you know, heard you talk about that on your podcast when you were getting interviewed. Production brewing is a different beast. It's a different, you know, mode of work and a different type of approach. Um, and it just ended up not being for me. I, I kind of wanted more of that pub life um, that I had at, in, in Vermont. I kind of knew that, but uh, those are, you know, harder jobs to find sometimes. Uh, there's just less people that work in those areas. So, um, like I said, my wife had gotten relocated to Arkansas for work. And I had gotten, you know, wanted to kind of move, move on from Allagash. And uh, so we picked Colorado and I came out here to help get a brewery off the ground for their production facility, which was odd 13 brewing. So I got to build out brewery. Um, we were set up to make about 15,000 barrels a year. We never really hit that cap while I was there. Um, but, you know, building out that facility was also a great learning experience. So I learned a ton. Um, we were part of the wave of hazy IPAs in the Colorado. So uh, it's kind of a stark, you know, contrast from the styles I focus on now. But um, it was a lot of fun to explore uh, that world. The, the world of hops and using hops and all the different hop products is is always changing, still changing. I, I looked at a can of IPA that someone gave me even yesterday or two days ago, and I, I didn't even know two of the products that were in there. I'd never heard of the types of hops. So it's kind of funny having been out of that, you know, chasing the newest hop products for about three years now. I just, I've already fallen behind. I already don't know what these newest products are. So you're uh, talking like down, downstream stuff, liquid products. So well, they had, they had incognito, which I knew they had lupo max, which was new to me. They had frozen fresh cryo, which I'd never used before, but I know what it is. And then they had Strata CGX. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. Like those are, and I've definitely never used them. Um, so it was, yeah, it's, yeah, all that, all the, I mean, I know the products are built for different things and I love that people are getting so specific with the products they need. And the beer was beautiful. I loved the flavor, um, but it probably had 10 different hot products in it, which is just, it's wild to think about that. That's, you know, where, where IPAs, some IPAs are, now and that you can use all these different products and all these different ways to create such a complex profile. So, um, yeah, it's been, I mean, that, that world was fun, but again, not really what I was enamored with. Um, I loved hop harvest. I miss that the most now making only Czech lagers with, you know, European and, and primarily Czech hops in my beers. Um, but I think that when I, you know, found this style of brewing that I'm doing now, that's really what you know, captivated me and kind of got me, I, I kind of knew once I dove into it, like, this is something I can see myself going with for, for a while. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of my, my brewing history. We've, uh, we've been open here about a year and three months now, so we're still relatively new. Um, obviously opened during, we were in a good spot in COVID when we opened, uh, but had to do a little bit of shutdowns, nothing, nothing like people that were open in 2020. We, we got lucky really with the timing of it. Um, but yeah, it took, you know, kind of in 2019, I decided to try and open, you know, this vision that I had about what cohesion could be. And then we finally got open in yeah, August of, of 21. So it took about a uh, year, two years to get open ish, uh, two and a half years to get open. And we've been open about a year and three months. So, yeah, well, that's awesome. Congratulations. It's a, uh, I know the, the journey, um, <laughs> how yeah. long were you still at odd 13? Like, while were you like, you know, Working yeah, and getting so, cohesion going while you're still there. Yeah, so I left Odd 13 in the spring of 2019. When I knew I was going to do cohesion, um, I kind of knew that I couldn't. I was the director of operations there, and it was too much mentally to also have time to focus on building my own project. So I left Odd 13 and helped some friends who maybe had transitions with head brewers or needed someone around who could help solve problems if problems arose and they just wanted, you know, someone who they knew they could trust around. Um, so I, I kind of bopped around, uh, 
Uh, I was at Outer Range. I was at Four Noses. I was at Cerebral, some other breweries just in Colorado that are friends of mine and wanted some help. <clears throat> and they were also willing to work with, you know, a flexible schedule where I could say, hey, I, I can only work four days a week because I need a day to focus on writing a business plan and finding funding and look at building, stuff like that. So I was, again, really fortunate to have connections already in Colorado that I could use to do that and, and keep brewing and keep, you know, you know, a little bit of income coming as well as continue to be on top of some of the brewing trends. Again, obviously, I missed all these hoppy things that have happened in the last two years, but I, I definitely stayed, you know, aware of, okay, here's what some people are doing and talking about beer and making beer. And it was, it was a great transition. And then October of 20, uh, yeah, October of 2020, I left brewing. I left other people's breweries to focus on construction at Cohesion. So starting in 2021, we broke ground. That's when I was kind of full-time here all the time, but yeah, so I was able to bounce around and, and keep working, which was which was a blast. Yeah, how did that uh, like departure from Out Thirteen go? Was it smooth for you? Or? Yeah, it was. I think I think it was a you know a little bit of surprise with some of my coworkers. Um, I I had always told my wife and told my friends that I didn't want to open a brewery. I thought it was a silly idea for me to pursue. I didn't think I would ever get to it, but it was really. Um, I hadn't really had an idea that I thought made sense, I guess, was really what it was. Because once I had the idea for cohesion, I was like, okay, I think this idea can make sense. I think this idea can work. Um, and I was sort of, you know, I told it to my coworkers in the sense of like, I have this idea that I, I have to see if it's, if it's going to work, if I can make it work. And, you know, I, I've enjoyed working with you guys, but, you know, I, I, I got to pursue this, uh, this vision that I have and see if I can get it off the ground. So um, it was, it was a good transition out. I think, um, you know, I had, I had definitely put in a lot of pretty solid, I, I thought SOPs and practices in place for people to follow. And so things transitioned pretty smoothly out. I think COVID, that was definitely a brewery that COVID, uh, affected pretty hard. Obviously no one knew that was coming in 2019, but, um, they, they have had to transition the ownership, uh, since then, but I think that it was just, yeah, COVID definitely was bearing down pretty hard on, on that brewery when, when they got to that point in their growth cycle. Um, so it made things a little difficult for them, but, um, yeah, it went, it went smoothly as smoothly as it can go. I think, you know, when you lose someone who's running a show like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. Um, I got sued when I left my, uh, <laughs> my previous brewery to open Noble Beast. So that was fun. Yeah. Um, I luckily, luckily I avoided any, any legal action, but <laughs> That's always for the best. Yes. Um, yeah. 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 So kind of walk us through like uh, visually, like for the people who haven't been to Cohesion and I've never been there. I've, I've you know, seen all the photos mm -hmm. and I remember following you guys kind of on Instagram from your construction photos, even, I don't know how, yeah. I, <laughs> you know, I just kind of see like the, the Czech style breweries and stuff. That's those are styles that I'm really enjoyed, you know, and, and interested in. Um, but visually, like a, the customer walks in the front door, like what, what do they see? What, what's, um, what catches the eye? Yeah. So we, we definitely, um, we worked with a fantastic architect and construction crew and really got to pull a vision together of what, uh, they, they did a great job of taking the things that we wanted out of a place that feels like a Czech pub and then modernizing it a touch and also making it, you know, a space that feels comfortable, um, clean and, and, you know, open and also visually interesting. So we definitely brought some element. We wanted something that a space, you know, my wife and I, when we look for places to go, we to eat or to drink or whatever, we're <clears throat> always interested in places that have some amount of visual appeal to them. Uh, obviously, you know, heavy design and heavy special features can get really expensive. So we had to find a way to balance that budget. So, um, my favorite description that I've heard well, came from uh, Kate Bernat, who writes for Good Beer Hunting, uh, as well as some other publications. And she said it's like a cathedral to Czech beer, uh, which I I appreciate. I think it's a little, you know, lofty <laughs> uh, definition, but I understand where she's coming from. And so we have, you know, it's a it's a tall ceiling. It's an old army supply depot. So uh, it's brick walls um, and then 
a very, you know, a white bar with some green tile on the back. And then we put the Lukers, the Luker towers up at, up front. So um, we have stainless steel bar tops, a lot of Wayne's coating, you know, dark woods, um, and then the concrete floor. So the, the Lukers, you know, being front and center was really our focus. And, um, you know, a lot of that came from our travels to check, looking at bars there, looking at how they approach service and the, you know, there's this pride and focus on pouring of beer that is a little bit different in the Czech Republic. Um, you know, they have yeah, absolutely. A, a lot of people use Luker faucets there. I would say, you know, the vast majority, uh, 90% or above. Um, while all of them don't pour to what I would say are Luker's standards of, you know, the Patinka Schnitt and Liko style pours or the different foam levels or the foam consistencies, um, you know, the places that really executed it well was the places that we kind of wanted to to emulate so um those places you know you often saw again the lukers are normally pretty pretty present um the, it's always uh custom the person who's pouring the beer is always facing the customer so they don't really have that design that you see in a lot of uh, breweries where the cold box is up against the bar and you have the taps in the cold box and so someone turns around to pour the beer so the 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 Czechs definitely take a lot of pride again in the service of beer. They have a saying there, uh, tapster is their kind of bartender equivalent. And they have a saying that the brewer brews the beer, but the tapster makes the beer. So the tapster is the, that final step, that final part of service is where the beer is really delivered. And it's, it encompasses not just the pouring, but the, the uh, storage of the beer, the handling of the beer, the cleaning of the lines, the cleaning of the faucets. It encompasses all of that, but it ends with, how well you pour the beer, how intentional you are about how you pour that beer and how you present it. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that when people walked in, they saw the bar, they saw the Lukers, and that was the focus. So we had a lot of design conversations about how do we get those front and center, not only because they're beautiful brass towers, the Lukers are visually appealing, um, but it was a way to emphasize and focus on this craft of pouring beer as the final step of this, this process. So it's, you know, the liquid is obviously important that we're drinking, um, but how it's served, how it's poured is another important aspect. And it's important to the, the Czech people. Um, I mean, they have a number of reasons that I've kind of dug into a little bit um, about why foam is so important. Um, but from a tapster perspective, I mean, they have a competition yearly for a master bartender and it encompasses all, again, all aspects of service, the cleaning, the pouring, and they have like a golden bar tower that moves around to different bars, depending on who's won that year. And it's a, you know, Pilsner or Kell sponsors this competition, but it's a big, it is, it, you see the guys and girls get really proud of winning this title and they're excited about it. And they have their own, you know, Tapster Instagram accounts where they're constantly talking about how they pour the beer and promoting how to pour beer. And it's, it's, it's really its own little subculture in Czech. And again, I think it was an important distinction for us to make as a brewery focusing on Czech beer culture and Czech beer styles, but also something that would be visually appealing to people. So, and then um, I also like we have the area I'm sitting in now is essentially you can see the whole brewing area from one side of the tap room. So we have a half wall that just divides it kind of like what I saw in the picture you sent me of your tap room. Um, so you can see into production and look at the brewery and kind of see what's happening and you know, for, for better or worse, there are conversations that happen over that half ball. And sometimes I don't want to <laughs> talk to people, uh, you know, I can, I can remember after CBC, uh, last in, in 2021, you know, Sunday of CBC, I was, I was pretty hungover and tired and I had to brew that day. And I remember, you know, a lot of people, a lot of brewers were coming up to that wall and wanting to chat, which I always appreciate. And I'd love talking beer with people, but I was, I couldn't do it that day. And I told the guys, I was like, listen, like, I really appreciate you coming here. I can tell that you want to talk to me. I'm too hungover. I just, I need to focus on this. Like, I'm really sorry. And so sometimes, you know, you have to, I have to draw that line. And, but a lot of times, like even talking with customers, it, it's really fun to have that interaction. And I think people really uh, enjoy it as well. Yeah. I, I love that. And obviously it's a, there's a pros and cons to that, but you know, our, our brewing space is really long and skinny. So that half wall, is very long, you know, and when we first opened, all the equipment was on the back wall. So it's completely exposed. There's no hiding whatsoever. And um, 
you know, we've added tanks and now there's like horizontal lagering tanks stacked that are block up a ton of it. So mm-hmm. now we have like all kinds of places to go and hide, which is pretty nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I agree that, you know, especially in like a, in a pub setting, that connection with the, the brewery and the brewers are, it's, it's, it's important for a lot of drinkers and it, it draws, it draws people in and it's just part of the experience. So, so, so your spot is, um, tap room. Do you have, do you do any food in there? We have food trucks that sit just outside. So we have a good patio, um, maybe 50, 60 seats on the patio. <clears throat> and then we have a, a nice spot for food trucks just off the patio. Um, so we have food trucks that come most, most days. Um, I have no restaurant experience. I've never worked a day in my life in a restaurant. I've worked behind a bar at a brewery a bunch of times, but, um, food is something that I am definitely interested in adding in, you know, in the same way that we approach Czech beer, adding in Czech food. I think, you know, there's some hurdles to it as there is with the beer. There's some language barriers. There's some unfamiliarity with what's being served and what what's being eaten um so i'm interested in at uh, someday maybe bringing that in um but for now it, we don't have uh, the capability we don't have the space we don't have the capital we don't have the people we don't have the no you know know how yeah. to do to do that i'm not i'm not pretending that that's an easy industry to try and tackle and so food trucks are you know they they can be difficult scheduling can be hard they cancel on you they're flaky but uh it's the best for us right now to bring people in but for the most part you know uh people are coming here just for the beer and just to to drink we offer some small snacks but um you know denver has such a strong beer culture and people really using tap rooms and breweries and and beer bars as meeting places um but breweries are definitely you know tap room breweries are at the top of that list and you know the busier ones in town are busy every day of the week, you know, from five to 10 PM, people are in there drinking beer, food truck or not, you know, people that's, it's a, it's a very common third space here in Denver, um, which is, is awesome to have that, that culture here. It, yeah, it is. I, I don't think that works nearly as well um, <laughs> up here in, in Cleveland, you know, there's, um, there's a lot more food offerings and stuff. Um, yeah. I guess, you know, so, so where does this like passion for Czech beers, um, come from have you have you spent a lot of time in the czech republic so i've made um three visits to czech uh the first was on my honeymoon with my wife um so we we started there my my parents had um spent some time in prague and my dad my dad also my parents both loved to travel um but you know they kind of instilled that love of travel in me and and different places um so they had said you know, as a wedding present, we'd like to take you to Prague uh, oh, nice. on basically as the beginning of your honeymoon, but, but also we get to be there. And I was like, okay, that's fine. Like, uh, so we spent three days there and um, it was, you know, relatively beer focused, but with the family as I'm, maybe you, you also experience, uh, you know, sometimes it can't be as beer focused as, as I would like, but we ended up, you know, spending a good amount of time in, in pubs and, and exploring beer in Czech and, I kind of knew right away tasting the beer. Uh, you know, I'd had Pilsner Kell here. I'd had the Budvar Dark, but never, uh, or Czech Bar Dark, but never the uh, Czech Bar Pale beer in the US. Um, and I'd had a number of Czech Pilsners from breweries here in the US, but um, something about the beers there tasted different. I knew, you know, I'd been brewing about eight or nine years at that point like, with a lot of sensory training at Allagash that had honed my ability to you know drink beer critically and i started to drink beer you know a little bit critically there because it's hard to back out of that habit sometimes and um i was like this is very different than how uh, beers that are labeled this way in the u.s taste and feel and are presented and then also you know uh then the beers that i've had in the u.s that are from the czech republic um so as you know we spent three days there exploring a little bit um i went back home and um, started researching as, you know, home brewers and brewers are known to do, they dive deep into a topic. And I went deep on Czech lager, read everything I could, you know, um, tried to understand everything I could and, um, kind of hatched the idea that I needed to go back and explore again. So we went back in 2019 and I already had the idea basically to open cohesion at that point. You know, I'd found enough that I thought was 
unique and interesting from a production standpoint that I wanted to go back and explore more and, and try and uh, share, you know, what I experienced with other people. So we went back in 2019 for about 10 days uh, with some friends and explored. And then uh, this year uh, I went for two weeks in the spring um, and got to explore a bunch. Uh, half of that trip was with the, the Czech embassy uh, sponsors, a few North American brewers to go uh, once or twice a year. They're kind of figuring out the program still. Um, so that we spent a week touring around breweries and malt production facilities, hop, hop processing facilities, pubs, um, and then equipment manufacturers all around the country. So um, yeah, it was, it was kind of just all of those experiences and I'm still learning about the beer culture and the beer production, but um, I've definitely confirmed a lot of what I think, you know, made the beer unique and different in those trips um, and learned a ton about the, uh, the way that beer is so uh, interwoven with that culture. You know, they, they drink the most beer per capita mm -hmm. by far in the Czech Republic. It's not close. And it's such an important part of, it's almost, you know, this national pride that, exists everywhere and we we have a you know a decent czech population here in colorado and in nebraska um it's kind of midwest so there might be some near you in ohio um but i've talked to people we have some antique beer labels uh, up on the wall and the, i've talked to a number of people that have they're from the areas where these breweries are and they'll come up and say like how did you find this label like this is my tiny little town uh you know an hour outside of pilsen in czech like how did you find this you know and they're very excited to talk to you about their town and their town's brewery and, and the beer that's made there. And it's the best beer. And, you know, they're, they're very uh, proud of that very, very local beer scene. And there might only be one brewery per town, but it's, it's our brewery, right. And they're, it doesn't really matter if the beer is objectively good or not, they're going to be proud of it. And it's probably going to be the best beer they've ever had. And you're not going to tell them otherwise. Um, and so it's this, you know, it, it's that kind of, I'm, I'm really curious to continue to explore the smaller towns and, and smaller breweries. And you're even seeing a resurgence of small lager breweries in Czech, which is awesome. They had a pretty big consolidation, uh, industrialization of lager, lager breweries, but um, some, of, some of the smaller town pubs are coming back, but yeah. Yeah, it was just, so, it was kind of, yeah, all those, all those trips have definitely influenced a lot, of, a lot of what we're doing here, obviously, and the desire to present that culture uh, to, to American craft beer drinkers. So how often did you come across uh, a bad beer? Because I know we like to romanticize all these small, <laughs> you know, European breweries, but, um, you know, just like uh, spots around here, they're not always, you know, yep. what you'd like. Exactly. To oh, yeah. Yeah, there's bad beer in Czech. There's bad beer everywhere. Um, I, I would say, I would say that, you know, to start with, you have to learn to accept diacetyl uh, if you're going <laughs> to drink beer in the Czech Republic. Um, Pilsner Kell has diacetyl in it, and the treatment of beer in the pubs uh, makes that level of diacetyl vary quite greatly. Um, I don't mind it as a component of that beer. Um, there are some Czech beers that I've had that have had a diacetyl that is over what I appreciate uh, as, as an amount in a beer. Um, but I think that. It's interesting, and I've had to do this a number of times because so there's also there's another brewery I went to that had high, high levels of chlorophenolic flavors in all of their beers. And I mean, it was it was like eating a Band-Aid um, wow. and it really wasn't good. But this is, you know, it to me. But this is also a brewery that sells. I don't know, they probably sold. 50 to 75,000 barrels of beer a year. I mean, it was a fairly industrial sized brewery serving a decent population and region. And at some point, you know, I've had to have the conversation with basically myself. I've had it with some other brewers, but thoughts of like, you know, how do I, do I need to suspend my idea of what good beer is? Because if you're selling that much of that beer, that means there's people that like that. And does that become a part of this style? Does that become a part of this culture? Um, I don't think that I could make beer that tasted like that here and it would be accepted, but again, obviously there is a region in Czech that makes beer like this and people drink it. Um, I, I don't have any desire again to make that, but it's, it's super interesting to drink it and try to think critically about, well, is, is this something that 
if I pointed it out to someone who maybe drinks this, grew up in this town, has lived in this town their whole life and drinks this beer every day, that they would see it as something that's bad about the beer? Or would they say, no, that's just part of the beer and I'm okay with it? Um, and it it becomes an interesting conversation for <clears throat> especially how Americans approach um, craft beer and how craft brewers approach it. And I, you know, that's not to say that the quality standards are lower, but I think that the overall, the Czechs have a very different emphasis on the quality control of their beer. A lot of it is, you know, fermented and, and, and lager it really cold and then drink it fast. Um, which yeah, if, if all of us American brewers could have enough people to come to our bar and drink the beer that we made in two or three weeks, you know, that, that would be great. We probably wouldn't have developed this necessity in the ways that we have for, um, sanitation and, and, um, you know, see, uh, yeah, sanitation of tanks and processes that maybe you don't always see in the Czech Republic. Um, but I think that it, the, they do often use pasteurization as a way to sort of ensure that the beer is going to stay stable. Um, and that's something that differs quite a bit from U S brewers, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's some of these small towns have had some, some bad beer. Some of them have had some beer that I don't know that I'll ever drink again, unless I'm, that's the only beer available. Uh, but then there's some of these small towns that have brewery that has definitely been uh, something that I've, you know, I've, I strive to make here uh, at, at Cohesion. But it's also, you know, our, our goal here is not to, um, uh, people asked a lot about GABF, you know, entering competition when that was around and in town. And, you know, I, I've always said the goal of Cohesion is not to win medals or um, to make the best beer. My, my highest compliment that, that I can get is when someone who is either Czech themselves or very familiar with Czech beer comes in and says, this beer reminds me of home. You know, that's I love that too. To, yeah. To me, that's winning. Like that's what I want. And I, and I know for a fact that no Czech person is ever going to come in here and say that this beer is better than Czech beer. They're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. Even if it was, they wouldn't say it. And so again, if I can get this idea of, and I'm not, I have no Czech heritage. I just have, you know, really fallen in love with this beer culture. Um, and if I can deliver an experience that makes people feel like, feel like they they're in Prague or in Pilsen or in their favorite pub in Czech, or that it's drinking beer that reminds them of that place, then that's, that's what I want to achieve. So when we hear, when I hear those things, that's really what continues to drive me to you know, connect with that culture and make beer that feels representative of it. And it's, it's been an interesting journey to try and recreate that. Cause again, there are flavors there that I know that, yeah, a Czech person might come in and say, Oh, I like this beer because, you know, it has diacetyl and my local town's brewery has a lot of diacetyl in their beer, but most of our consumers, American consumers would not like it. And craft brewers in particular would come down pretty hard on it. So it's been an interesting balance to figure out how to, you know, always embrace those flavors that you find in some of those smaller Czech, Czech breweries. Yeah. I don't believe in uh, style appropriate diacetyl. So I think I might <laughs> struggle with uh, some of those beers. I've actually never had the, uh, the fortune to, to go over there. I had this, this awesome trip planned out in 2020 and like most 2020 trips that got canceled. And um, <laughs> yeah, we've got three little kids and that was, you have these little windows in between having kids where you can take like a European vacation. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> those windows have closed again for a while, so I'm not sure when I'm going to make it over. But I, for some, I really for some it. period, yeah, you'll, yeah, yeah, it's not their their beer culture is not going anywhere. If it survived, you know, the 20th century, I think I think they're going to keep it rolling. So <laughs> I'm going to have to uh, hit up. Uh, would you say it was the embassy? It's like sponsoring people to go. Over yeah, there? that's cool. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you more details when when we're off the podcast for sure. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it was last year or year before I canned, uh, you know, Czech Amber, pull it Mave. And mm -hmm. um, I, with the artist, we, we wrote the whole can was in, was in Czech. There wasn't really any English anywhere on it. Um, I'm not sure if I was allowed to do that, but we did. And uh, it was picked up by um, like the Czech embassy and reposted on their Facebook or something. And all, I have no idea what they're saying, right? Because everyone's like, <laughs> like commenting in Czech. Everyone loved it, but... Um, yeah, it was just, it was, that was kind of funny. Yeah. Well, that's great. We're going to uh, take a quick break. And then after that, we'll move into some of the more technical aspects of 
brewing tech beers and the brewery setup. And I know there's a lot of different equipment and things like that. Um, so we'll take a short break for this message and then come right back for more of this conversation with Eric Larkin, Cohesion Brewing. First Tea is a proud sponsor of the Brewer to Brewer podcast. They've been working with brewers on a wide range of ingredients and delicious beers. First Tea combines the flexibility of order sizes with the experience you need to create innovative and successful tea beers. They get you the most direct from farm tea selection, so you are working with flavorful and consistent products. You can find more about First Tea's collaborations with brewers and tea ingredients by visiting blog.firsttea.com. That's blog.firsttea.com. Okay, so um, Czech beers are often defined by decoctions, something Mm -hmm. uh, fairly unique in this modern time. Um, often debated as being completely unnecessary, a waste of energy, possibly even contributing deleterious effects to the to longevity, the the shelf stableness of the beer. Um, tell me about uh, tell me about your brew house first off. What makes the decoctions possible? Do you have a, a unique brew house that's different from you know most people in your area? Yeah, I would say we have a brew house that's you know, crafted for decoction specific, uh, brewing. So we, uh, it's modeled after, I would say, I don't know, about half, maybe two thirds of the breweries I've seen in check their brew houses would typically have a, a mashed kettle, a louder ton and a whirlpool. So a three vessel system. Um, but most times the whirlpool is, uh, is often physically separated from the, the brew house quite a bit. So a lot of times it looks like in pictures, it's only a two vessel brew house, but it's often a three vessel brew house because obviously you can't whirlpool inside a vessel that has a mash mixer inside of it. It would break up that cone in the middle. Um, so we have, we, we did some specific things for decoction. We increased the pipe size um, and we uh, have a larger pump to move around decoction. We looked at a positive displacement pump, a PD pump, um, didn't find the cost to fit in our budget. Um, I know Ashley at Bierstadt has one and they do decoctions over there and she loves it. I would love to have one, but I think it was a 15 or $20,000 pump that um, we decided we decided to forego and try and do and not add into the brew house. So um, you just out of curiosity, to, what, what style of PD pump is that? Like I have a flex impeller pump for moving mesh, which is PD and it really didn't cost a whole lot more than a centrifugal. Yeah. I, I didn't, once they said that number, I was, I didn't really <laughs> was like, nope. dig, dig into it too much more. I was like, I, I think we can do without this. And I was working at, uh, so four nose is one of the breweries I worked at had, um, installed. So they have a, just a two vessel system, mash louder, kettle whirl. Um, and they had been able to build the auction into their process, um, by adding a four inch port above the plates on the, on the louder ton. And then hooking, and then they had a reducer down to inch and a half. We had inch and a half hoses that went uh, out of the louder ton and into the kettle. Um, you did need to manually stir if you wanted to, for sure, avoid scorching. I don't know if that was necessary or not, but we did it anyway. Um, and then we would just switch the hoses back to move from the kettle after post decoction into back into the the mash louder ton. Um, so I kind of knew after working with that system that these regular floor centripetal pumps can move mash, especially if it's thin enough. Um, sure, you might get a little bit of blockage, um, and you have to have some water cleared, you know, ready, primed to clear a pathway. Um, but it really wasn't, it wasn't, uh, that much of a hurdle. Um, and it's been interesting because when we do, um, collaborations with other breweries, decoction is a, is a necessity for us. We, we won't, I won't collaborate with someone unless we can decoct. And I've, found so far as to move buckets of mash around to make that possible. But a lot of times, you know, people, I tell them we can use, you have a floor pump, right? We can use that. And they are skeptical of it, but we've made it work a number of times. So um, I think that there's definitely some extra cleaning steps and extra flushing steps to get grain out of every pipe. You know, I am positive there is grain in my heat exchanger. I, you know, there's, grain in every pipe in my brew house and I have to do a lot of extra cleaning and there's definitely a lot of extra water usage to get that flushed out post brew. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, I think it's not, it can be, there are definitely easier ways than I think people realize to incorporate decoction into their, uh, 
production methodology. I'm not saying it's not going to slow down your brew day. I'm not saying, you know, you can triple batch on a decoction day. I think that's a bad idea. Um, you know, I heard you talk about pulling triple batches and even triple batches on single infusion sounds awful, but you know, that if you add decoction in there, yeah, I don't, I don't think that's something you should be pursuing, but, uh, if you, if you can build the time into the schedule to allow for decoction brewing, um, I, I pretty firmly believe it does make a difference in the final product. Um, and for us again, you know, in the same way that I'm guided by, um, the desire to make a beer that reminds people of a place and a, and a time or, you know, their beer culture. Um, I'm also driven by historic and uh, traditional Czech brewing methods. So I don't go as far back as the wooden aging and, uh, you know, pitch line barrels, uh, but I'm kind of in like a mid 20th century, what I kind of see from breweries that were built around that time and the production methods that they have. Um, so decoction mashing uh, in particular at that time is uh, everyone is doing it and everyone still does it. And it's uh, so I, I kind of look to how, how would a traditional Czech brewer make this beer? That's how I want to make the beer. So sometimes people ask me, why do you do this step? And sometimes I have a very clear answer, you know, because I like this beer, but a lot of times, or I like the way this makes the beer taste, but a lot of times it's, I, I built this place to, be brewed in the production styles of a certain time and place. And that is why we do what we do. Um, and the more you explore Czech brewing and talk to Czech brewers, decoction is necessary. It's, there is no other way. Uh, every brewmaster I've talked to in Czech that I can have a conversation that I feel confident enough in English to <laughs> ask these or Czech English, you know, and, and brewer as a third language in there. Uh, to have these conversations, they all tell me that decoction is necessary. Um, Václav Verka, who's the brewmaster emeritus at Pilsner Kell, we asked him directly on that embassy trip, you know, can you make a Czech lager, a Czech beer without decoction? He said, absolutely not. It's not possible. But that's that's the guy that was at CBC, right? Yep. Sure yep. Same, yeah, same he's going to get it. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. He's, he's a character. He's, I, I, I often, uh, like to describe him as like the Pilsner Raquel show pony. He's, he's the best. He's, he's yeah. a blast to hang out with. He's a, such a great guy. He really was open on that tour to talking to us about a lot of things. Uh, interestingly enough, said things on a private tour that were different than what he said, the CBC talk, but that's a different conversation about Pilsner Raquel and their strange lore and interesting things about that brewery. Uh, but overall, everyone you talk to, you know, you say, okay, can you walk me through your brewing process? And they start with, so they call them mashes. Remutovani is the word in Czech for mashing or mash. And they literally say, well, we do two mashes for this beer. And so you're like, well, what, what does that mean? And they say, well, that's, we do a mash at this temperature and then we boil it. And then we do a mash at this temperature and then we boil it. And that's, that's everyone. They don't, they don't, again, they don't really have a word for decoction, it's just a part of mashing. It's not an above and beyond. It's not an extra step. Um, it is how you do it. Um, mm -hmm. And I've also heard this anecdote um, from Evan Rail that there's a, a brewing high school, like a trade school in Czech. So instead of going to regular high school, you can go to brewing high school to learn how to be a brewer. And in that brewing high school, when you're learning mashing, first you learn decoction, and then you learn about single infusion. So the primary mode of creating, you know, of this mashing process is decoction. Um, and so for me, you know, it's, again, it's about, we, we also built a slightly under modified uh, custom base malt with a local maltster. So we have this uh, local maltster that was able to work with us on this and has uh, been part of why I think, you know, the decoction does add more to our beer because we're working with a product that, it still doesn't need it. You could still single infuse with this malt and you'd be fine, but it, it you know, brings forward some of the characteristics of malt that may have required decoction in previous times that also uh, helps us bring those flavors forward. So for us, you know, I, I often hear people talk about the cohesion beers. Um, and one of the first comments I received before we were open from a supplier who was dropping off crowlers or something, and he came in, and the first thing he said was, wow, the mouthfeel on this beer is crazy. And I said, I mean, you don't normally hear people say mouthfeel as the first thing that they talk about a beer. Um, 
But I do think that the coction adds a certain mouthfeel and depth of grain flavor to a beer. I've also heard it talked about by another brewer who's emphasizes decoction quite a bit. <clears throat> it's almost like a, a pedal. And as you do more decoctions, you're pushing the pedal further down for intensity of grain flavor. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is it the most efficient process in the world? Absolutely not. Does it use a lot more energy and water than a regular brewing process? 100%. Does it make your brew day longer? Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it has a lot of negatives to it, depending on your perspective. But for me, again, grounding myself in traditional Czech lager production techniques, I, I have to do it. There, is, there isn't another way to create this beer and to create something that comes together as a beer that feels and can potentially feel like something that you would find in the Czech Republic. And, you know, I think I've heard other brewers talk about this too, especially lager brewers. And I agree, lager beers and all beers are a collection of small choices that make a big difference. Sometimes with an IPA, maybe, you know, if you dry hop with nugget instead of mosaic, it's going to taste very different, right? The ingredient does make a huge difference in that profile of the beer. Uh, but there are still, and, and lager beer, I think maybe a touch more, there are a lot of small decisions you make to make a beer uh, change a lot in the end, because we're not working on wide swings of one input, like that one ingredient that can change the flavor profile so drastically. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Um, so are most of your beers single decoction, double, triple? So we do uh, our, our cohesion 10 degree, which is in the Desitka, uh, which is like tenor slang in Czech um, style is, is the closest equivalent I think people know would be like a German Helles. Um, that beer is single decocted. Um, any of our lagers that include uh, dark malt, anything from amber, to our tamave, which is our dark lager, our polo tamave, and then up, those are double decocted. Um, and then any 12 degree beer, which uh, Svetli Lejak is the style, or Dvanatska, um, which is 12er, uh, we do a triple decoction. So um, it depends on the beer uh, style. And then if we're doing a collaboration or something unique, it's kind of a part of the profile. So like we did, um, I, I've, been jokingly calling it a pseudo lager. I know it's not a pseudo lager. I know people will probably come down my throat for that, but we made a Kolsch with the brewery and I jokingly called it a pseudo lager. But like for that beer, we, we dry hopped it with Riwaka, which again, not traditional Czech, but it's something that this brewery down in the Baker neighborhood of Denver called Novel Strand does. Um, they use a lot of New Zealand hops. He has great connections there. He makes a fantastic Kolsch. So I was like, let's do one because we also open ferment. So let's do an open, a decocted open fermented Kolsch it's dry hop with Riwaka. And for that beer, you know, we knew the hops were certainly going to shine a little bit more. So uh, we did a single decoction on that beer because we wanted to balance that in a way that the hops kind of didn't have as much grain flavor to push over. Um, so it's, it, once we're past those, our kind of house beers, it, it's a part of the discussion of um, how, what we want this beer to come out like. Um, we just did a beer with Cerebral uh, uh, an 11 degree lager, which is less classified in the Czech kind of canon of beers styles. It doesn't have as much of a specific uh, ness to it uh, compared to a 10 and a 12 and a tamave and a polo tamave. Um, and so we did a single decoction for that beer, but that was also because it was at their brewery where decoction is really difficult. And so doing it twice just seemed like asking for trouble. So one decoction was enough there for us to get the flavors we needed. So it's, you know, there's practical concerns as well as um, considerations for the recipe. So we kind of have to meld all that together and we decide how many we're doing. Cool. So going back to like the equipment a little bit more, when you do these, these cooks, they're in the mash kettle, or do you have a, a separate like cereal cooker, a third or a second kettle? Yeah, no, I think uh, I would love to have that, <laughs> but no, we just, we do it all in the mash kettle. So Mash into mash kettle, a move, you know, the correct amount of the, for the step we're doing of mash over to the louder ton and then cook, boil that part of the mash and then, and then move it over, uh, mix everything together, do a rest of appropriate time and then move. If we're doing a second decoction, then we'll move, uh, you know, another portion back, um, cook it again and then pump it back into the louder ton. 
So, so how do you do that through a centrifugal pump? Is that, are you just kind of swapping inlet and outlet type of things? We have, we have two different pathways built. Yeah. So we have a number of valves you can flip to change inlet and outlet. So actually the outlet can become the inlet um, based on how our piping is, is set up. Um, so we can do, we have basically two different outlets and then and a, a, a primary inlet that we can flip to accept uh, inlet from a number of different places, basically. So some of the inlet piping can become outlet piping and vice versa, but um, it's kind of a mess <laughs> under, under the brew house, but yeah, it, it took some configuring with the manufacturer to get all that um, set up. There are, uh, there are sometimes I don't need to use if I'm doing a second decoction. So I've mashed in, moved uh, some over, boiled, moved the rest over, mixed. There are some times where I don't even need to uh, pump it back. I can just fill by gravity out of the louder ton back into the mash kettle, okay. uh, depend, depending on the amount that I need. So that's also proven to be effective. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. in an ideal world, you know, moving mash uh, from a louder ton is not the best way to do it. Um, I do find sometimes I need to add water uh, into a second or third decoction just to get the uh, water to grist ratio that I need. Um, but it depends on a lot of, a lot of factors. And I'm, you know, honestly still dialing in decoction schedules and, and temperatures. Um, one of the big things that was hard for us, we boil at 202 here instead of 212 because we're at elevation. And so a lot of the recipes are written for boiling at sea level. And so obviously the Delta, uh, temperature difference between what you're adding and what you have is different than a lot of the literature that is written about it, which there isn't a ton, but when you find schedules and amounts, um, you know, the rough numbers you hear is a third, but it can be hard to dial in the amounts that we need to make the temperature jumps that we want between certain ranges. All right. Um, so one of the, one of the things that I like, you know, kind of look out for is, um, in the beginning stages of a decoction, like not leaving your main mash at a protein rest for too mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. So you have a um, kind of a, a custom malt, correct? Are you are you mm -hmm. the only one that's using that, or other people? Other people can use it. It's available, um, but does anyone else really regularly use it? No, not not on a long term basis. I know there's a a brewery in, on South Broadway here in Denver, maybe 20 minutes south of us, that uses it for some of their lagers. There's a guy that uses it for some of his hoppy beers. Um, but they don't, I mean, they don't make a ton and they, I, I have first dibs on it essentially. So like they know that they need to meet my production amounts and we've agreed on that. And then whatever's left over other people can use. So. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I use a, a Czech malt, four malted malt from a uh, Cicado, which we've found to be really, really nice. Um, but oh, that's nice. pretty interesting that you have a, you know, kind of your own specialty malt made up. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so do you, um, what do you do there? Do you, uh, are your, is how long are your protein rests, I guess, at, at times? Mm -hmm. And I've heard, yeah, I mean, I've heard this same idea that, uh, too long of a protein rest can negatively affect head retention. Um, I haven't, I don't think uh, it's hard with the Luker faucets because we can produce so much foam so easily. Um, and it does sort of retain uh, a little more easily, I feel like possibly because of what the Luker faucet is doing to the beer. Um, but I, I haven't been scared of leaving a beer at protein rest for an hour, you know, on the lower end of a protein rest. Um, none of those beers have turned out looking or acting in a way in respect to head retention and foam retention that I've been upset with. Um, I have tried to make the same beer sometimes avoiding a long protein rest and sometimes having a protein rest, uh, that, you know, extended protein rest during a decoction step. Um, and I haven't really noticed a huge difference, but I also haven't done a lot. It's like, you know, sample size of one or two. So yeah, I'm sorry to test those things. <laughs> yeah. I'm not, I'm not on a heavy, we just don't, we don't make a lot of beer. I mean, so I I've made, you know, 40 batches so far total. So it's not, you know, we make, we brew like two or three times a month right now. So I don't have a lot how of big, How big is your brew house? Uh, 15 barrel. 
15. Okay. So, wow. Yeah. We made, we made 355 barrels last year. So, I mean, we're not, yeah. we're not a big brewery at this point. So I just don't have a lot of repetition to practice that on. Um, but it's something I'm, I've heard and I'm interested in exploring. Um, again, my, when it's kind of this, when in doubt, what do the checks do? Like, that's my mentality. So I often, if I'm curious about these things, I often go back to my notes that I've taken from conversations I've had with Czech brewers. And I look at their temperatures and I say, do they sit in protein rest for a long time? And sometimes they do. So I'm okay with that. Um, and, I, and I haven't seen such a negative effect on the beer that I'm, I'm worried about it. Uh, but yeah, I, I've definitely heard that. Uh, I've, I'm playing around with it still. I don't say, I wouldn't say I have any kind of conclusive idea around that at this point. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm, uh, I guess it's something maybe I, I should fret about less because we, we have a separate, um, a second kettle, like another cooker. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do some split mashes where we'll mash in a third of the malt right into the cereal cooker and start that decoction. And by the time it gets up to a boil, then we'll mash in the final two thirds to a protein rest, but only mm -hmm. let it sit for you know 10, 15 minutes and then bring that decoction back to go up to beta. So it's interesting. Um, yeah. And I, I do have, again, the malt I'm using, the custom base malt is a little protein heavy. So it's not, it's not out of spec. It's not crazy, but the, the malt specifically has a higher level of protein. And obviously protein is a big contributor to foam, head retention, those things. So I think working with a different raw material can also provide a lot of different results. So it's hard to say that what I'm seeing would translate to someone that uses uh, the malt you're using or a Vireman Bohemian floor malted or Raven or any you know other supplier of a, a floor malted malt or, or non-floor malted malt. So it's hard to blanket say that, especially because we're using such a unique raw material that what I'm seeing would replicate other places. I'm um, going over to the lucre faucets. Uh, we we have one, and I've always had issues with dialing <laughs> in that foam. Yeah. So, in your experience, like, what are you carving the beers to to go through there? And mm -hmm. have you had, kind of had to go outside the norms of uh, draft line installs as far as restriction goes, or like, kind of, mm -hmm. what's your experience with how do you get a good pour out of those? Yeah, I'll I'll start with saying uh, I am the draft line equations draft systems is one of my biggest weak spots as a brewer. I don't enjoy it. I don't understand it. I really uh, just wanted to that step to be over and done with <laughs> and working as soon as it could here. And then I haven't really messed with it. Um, so that's not something that I'm like, I haven't spent a lot of time dialing into. I had a nice resource that I let someone borrow and they lost. And so I'm also kind of flying blinder than I normally would be, but um, for me, also the Czech beers are a little bit lower carbs, um, than maybe a German equivalent lager style. Uh, so I find Czech beers to be carbonated between two, two, five and two, four. Um, and in tasting them, they definitely taste lower carb. I think it helps with the drinkability of it. I think there's less of a sensation on your tongue and on your palate that allows for it just to kind of flow pretty smoothly, uh, as you're drinking it. So we, I generally target, uh, two, three to two, four for our beers. Um, we, we, all, we naturally carb everything, everything is funded. Um, so it, we can, I have to adjust sometimes if, you know, I'm, I'm adjusting fermentation or, or a de -rest temp or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's still, there's still variability on our beers in terms of the amount uh, and capability to produce foam uh, on the pores. So we've had beers that have been a little bit lower carb where the bartenders tell me I can't get any foam out of this. Um, and I've had to adjust process. We've had beers that on the higher carb level that are really, really difficult uh, to pour properly. Um, the biggest hurdle is certainly the, the amount of um, focus it takes for a bartender to pour a proper check pour correctly and efficiently. Um, when all, we only have six beers on tap, but when all six are a little different. So I think that they're like right now, we have one beer on tap that's on the lower end of carb. And I've watched the bartenders, especially when it's busy and they lose focus a little bit, um, not be able to pour the right amount of foam and they have to make adjustments as they're pouring. And then I've seen in that same busy time, you know, they have to, uh, adjust how slowly they pour 
or how much foam they put in before they open the faucet to full beer because the beer has a little bit higher carb. And so if they don't do that, they end up overpouring quite a bit of beer, which is always hard for me to watch them just overpouring a beer as the <laughs> owner who's, who sometimes actually looks at the numbers of how this all works. As I'm sure you can understand when you just see bartenders overpouring like crazy um, to get to get the proper amount of beer in there. So it's it takes it takes a lot of, you know, I, I think it's part of the fun. Honestly, while I don't like the construction of draft systems, pouring on a lucre to me is is enjoyable because it makes you focus on the act of what you're doing. You can't just blindly pour a lucre faucet like you can't. You know, those people who are very skilled bartenders, it's, it's not that it's not skillful. But the, you know, shaker pint, double tap, open, yeah. have a conversation, close somebody out, you know, close and have two beers ready. Can't do that with a Luger. You, it's not, it's not really possible. Um, so I, I enjoy that aspect uh, of the process, but it takes, you know, refinement and training and emphasis. We do bartender competitions for poor, like for our monthly all staff meetings, but there's only five of us. So it's not really that hard but um you know every now and then we'll do like a tapster competition and we'll say like okay who's pouring the best schnitt who's pouring the best sladinka and we'll i'll judge them on a number of criteria and like we have to remind them like hey this beer you know it's a part of it becomes a part of a beer release like hey this beer a little lower carb you know make sure when you're pouring you build a lot of foam before you open to beer so it, it becomes just a part of our process to uh, keep the the quality where we want it, but it, yeah, it's not, it's not simple. Um, and when we first opened, you know, we had five bartenders who had never poured on a lucre faucet before, and we lost a lot of beer. I mean, we, we <laughs> dumped a lot of beer trying to get it right because I told them I would rather if, if you didn't pour the beer, right, dump it out and try again. And it's okay. Like that. I know that that's what it's going to take to get this to where we want it to be. Um, and so that's, that's what we've had to do, but um, yeah, it, it, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a constant refinement for sure. How do you communicate like to your customers the, in these style of beers and in this way of service, there's so much that goes into it that most people at the end of the day, don't really care about. So how yeah. do you make them care? How do you explain to them what decoction is, what these pores are, why it matters without, you know, annoying them yeah. or just giving them useless information. So like, what's your strategy? Cause I'm sure you've thought all this. Yeah. through. Uh, I mean, then we're still adjusting obviously, but um, for the poor styles. So I, I think a big thing to start with is that we have, uh, we were fortunate to be set up in a city that really has embraced us uh, both the craft breweries, the craft brewery adjacent businesses, bars uh, have supported us from day one and have pushed people to come here, recommended people to come here. Uh, and we couldn't be more grateful to have that support. And I think that it starts a lot of times from that point of, hey, so-and-so told me to come here. I trust them. You know, maybe I was at Cerebral Brewing and they said, you know, on a beer tour and they said, go to Cohesion. You should check it out. And when you have a good experience at one place and they tell you to go to another place, you're kind of already trusting of what that place is giving you. So someone, a lot of times the customers have come in and we don't have a lot of foot traffic where we're at. A lot of it is people coming here because they want to. Um, so we're getting customers who are coming in a little more open-minded, I think, because it's become recommended. And again, it's, we're so fortunate to be in a place where the industry has supported us to that point. So that I think helps quite a bit, but when you have that person who is just here on their own, didn't have anyone tell them, um, you know, it, it does take a bit of education and, and, uh, focus on it. So we have images on the menus, on the chalkboards, behind the bar um, of the different foam pour types. Um, so we're kind of constantly making people aware of that. Um, the last resort for the foam in particular, the behind the bar, like uh, the top shelf behind the bar, there's a Pilsner or Kell sign that has the three pour styles on it. And I've always told the bartenders, if someone's really not happy with it, you can say, well, this is how Pilsner Raquel does it. And we're trying to emulate Czech traditions. So this is how we do it. Like you've probably heard of Pilsner Raquel. They do it this way. We're also doing it this way. And, and so that has often ended the conversation, you know, if it gets to that point. Um, in terms of all the process steps, I mean, we try to offer some information on amounts of decoction and types of hops in the beers. Um, 
but not overwhelm people with the details, right? I think at the end of the day, uh, one of the things I love about Czech beer is that it's beer that can be talked over, not talked about, right? This is beer that tastes like beer. This is beer that you can, and the reason beer is so drunk so much in Czech is because the pubs are such a strong third space in the Czech Republic. It's where you go to meet with people and talk to people and catch up and see friends and hang out. And that's a lot of what we wanted to create here as well. So creating beer that, yes, we can have those conversations. We could talk about the beer for 30 minutes in this type of environment. I love doing that. But we can also, we don't have to have that conversation for you to accept the beer. The phone becomes the biggest part where people are pushed push back on. But, and if you want to have that conversation, our bartenders have been trained. You know, we do about four to five hours of training as a, with a new hire on uh, styles, production, and pouring. Um, so they're able to have those conversations. But if you're a customer that just wants a beer, I don't really need to, other than the foam, again, I don't need to explain much more because you're going to take a sip of this and it's going to taste like a beer you've had before. It has beer, generic beer-like qualities that most people are not going to, you know, whereas a sour beer, sometimes you have to say like, hey, this beer is sour because we made it sour. And there's this intense flavor that you might not have recognized or isn't common in the mass-produced beers or this beer is really hoppy. Like we added a ton of hops into this beer. So it has a flavor that's going to overwhelm you. You know, there's, but with Czech lager beer, that explanation is, is a little bit diminished, but we're, we're here for the longer conversations, but we don't try to have them um, unless it's something that becomes necessary, I guess, or, or something that someone is interested in. And then we're willing to have that conversation. Um, but yeah, it, it takes a good amount of training. We try and have bartenders also shadow a brew. Um, you know, once a year or something like that, just to stay fresh on the that side of the process and continue the education and training is is a big a big part. But um, yeah, it's it's an interesting to try and get people to understand what's what's going on here. Yeah, it's definitely. Um, I'm sure you need a, an awesome staff that's well trained and, and really <laughs> kind of gives a shit about it because it's yeah. it's all about communication and, and like yeah. transferring that passion. Your passion has to go to the bartenders, which has to go to the consumers. And obviously yeah. it's, it's difficult. Um, there's, there's a couple other technical things I wanted to ask you about uh, mm -hmm. that are, one I've heard you talk about open fermentation. And then the other that's pretty um, style specific to Czech beers is water. Yeah. So I don't know anything about your local water. You know, is it mm -hmm. soft? Do you use <clears throat> RO? What are you doing there? And then. I'm personally super interested to learn about how you do open fermentation because it's not something I do. And um, I'm, I'm looking at maybe getting one tank that can, can do that. But uh, so kind of tell me about uh, those two things. Yes. Yeah, so for us, we're using RO water. Um, Denver has three different water sources that fluctuate in hardness levels. Um, obviously the prog and Pilsen and Czech water profile is pretty soft. So we attempt, we attempt to hit about 15 ppm of total hardness. The uh, RO filter takes it down between three and five. And then we basically just add back a touch of non-RO water um, to get up to that level. So run a quick calculation based on what's coming in and then add a little bit back. Um, and yeah, I think the water is hugely important. <laughs> um, I think that uh, it's another reason why we can't really make check beer because we don't check water. Um, I, I think water is... A, and a huge component of the flavor profile of beer um, and makes a big difference in the final product. So getting that water profile softer at least was something I knew was important and we had to, to build in here. Um, so everything, everything is 97, 98% RO water based on what we need to hit that hardness level. Um, and then open fermentation, again, it's looking at traditional Czech brewing, open fermentation was a thing. Um, there are definitely Czech lager producers now who do not use open fermentation for a variety of reasons. Um, but there are a lot of Czech breweries who are um, also uh, not doing uh, that open fermentation uh, because of, of, you know, uh, or sorry, a lot of Czech breweries, older Czech breweries that are still doing open fermentation because they've, they don't want to replace all that equipment, right? They're, massive industrial breweries that have spent a lot of money and it would be like, you know, start over, like buy, buy everything again. And I think that they're not really interested in that. Um, and they, everyone treats the open fermentation a little bit differently in terms of how careful they are with it, I guess. Um, 
Some of them we haven't been, I haven't been allowed to see because they're concerned about contamination risk. Some of them you literally walk through on a tour and like you could cannonball into and <laughs> nobody could, nobody could stop you. Uh, Scoop and out some croissant, bring it home. Yeah. With you. And there's just open doors on either side. Like it's just in the brewery. So, I mean, there's some, there's one place that where uh, it's maybe 10, 15 feet from the brew house, the open fermenters, and they only use them a few times a year, but I mean, they're just, I mean, next, next to the fermenters, next to the brew house, like it's no big deal. Um, so for me, the open fermentation is, uh, again, it is a part of the historical process, but it does provide for a slightly less stressful environment on the yeast, right? Even in a closed vessel, when you have an airlock, there is a little bit of pressure that needs to be created to push the air out of the tank and through the, the water or liquid that's holding that back. And that, you know, to me, it's about reducing pressure on the yeast, reducing stress on the yeast and creating a better environment for it to ferment in. Um, that's sort of one of the reasons I think it creates a difference in the beer. Uh, obviously, people have talked about Belgian English styles that are higher ester producing. If they're in an open fermenter, um, you know, lager yeast doesn't really push a ton of esters, but um, I, I kind of think it makes a, a less stressful environment for the beer in the same way that a lagering tank at certain hydrostatic pressures does change the stress on the yeast and the amount of weight on that yeast as it continues to finish and clean up its fermentation. You know, we're not at a size where that calculation is as impactful at 15 barrel sizes, but um, it's still the methodology that, that we wanted to follow. So we have a dedicated room for the open fermentation with a positive pressure HEPA filtered room, um, but we also don't package and distribute. So, you know, if it tastes good in the lagering tank, it's going to taste good on tap. Um, as long as, you know, we keep our lines clean, lucers clean, cakes clean, stuff like that. So there's also, uh, with the model we've chosen to keep it small and keep it in-house and we don't have any plans to can and distribute. We want people to come here and experience uh, you know, the, the place that we have and, and the beers through the looper taps um, that allows me to stress a little bit less about it. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the breweries who still do open fermentation pasteurize their beer uh, out of necessity almost. Um, there, are, there are industrial breweries that certainly don't have the same level of sanitation that I see in American craft breweries and and that's because they know they're going to pasteurize and they know the beer is not going to be impacted by any spoilers because it's never rising above six or eight degrees Celsius before it's pasteurized. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a different approach, a different production method, um, that creates obviously a very different product. Um, but it's super interesting to look at the difference in the breweries that still do it and don't and try and ask why or what flavors are there. And that's something I'm still, as I continue to travel over there, exploring and trying to figure out like, you know, who does this? Why do they do it? Why haven't they changed? Um, how, how do they possibly keep this clean? Um, I mean, there's, there are some breweries that they have, you know, the glycol inside the open fermenters is literally uh, in the inside wall of the fermenter. There's six or seven loops around the outside of piping. You know, there's no way that anybody is getting that 100, 100% 100 clean every single time. I just don't. I mean, I know somebody at some point has gotten lazy and not scrubbed the entire thing, right? And they've still made beer from that. So, so uh, it, it's an interesting, you know, thing to look at when you get into these uh, industrial breweries and check and, and think about for sure. Well, um, you've obviously got the technical operations of brewing these unique beers down it's pretty interesting um i'd, to, I'd say to, we're still we're still learning but yeah it, it's absolutely yeah we always <laughs> are um so to wrap things up here pretty soon but uh and move away from beer you know as, as a business owner and you know somebody who's hands-on in in the in the brewery all the time like what do you do to ensure that um the culture of your company you know, is, is where you want it. I think that obviously starts at the top and it's the responsibility of, of you know, your, yourself and, and your wife and, and the same with me. And, and, and also how does your wife, um, you know, play into this as well, as far as like setting the tone of the culture and, and accountability for that? Yeah, it's, it's really tough. Uh, it's a constant balance. Um, and with, we have to have people that we trust so much to deliver something, you know, we're, 
breweries are always so different than restaurants where, you know, restaurant owners, chef owners, which is the closest equivalent to what we're doing as, as brewer owners, you know, chef owners are also there cooking the food at the restaurant during service all of the time. Um, I, I am not that way. Most brewery owners I know are not in place during service all the time. Um, so developing that trust and allowing our bartenders the confidence to deliver the product that we want is really important and, and it is really difficult. Um, you know, we've, we have an incredible staff right now. We really have people that are bought in and I think enjoy what we're doing. I think that they see the attention, you know, it, like you said, it starts from the top in terms of setting a tone and an understanding of importance. And like, to me, what we're doing, you know, uh, the details about it are, are very important. So I have to make sure I stay in tune with the details so that they also stay in touch with the details. Um, it requires a lot of communication. Um, I've seen, I, I feel like any time I've gotten to the root of a major issue uh, in any brewery I've worked in, other other breweries that I have been satisfied or unsatisfied with or work environments that I've been happy or unhappy in, um, it's all about communication. You can really boil it down to communication a lot of times. So we really, again, we, we meet with the whole staff once a month. We have an in-person meeting. Um, we try to do a great job of maintaining a strong line of communication. Um, it, it's hugely important. And um, I think that, you know, my, so my wife, Lisa, she works full-time, not at the brewery, um, but any of the major decisions, any of the, especially when it comes to writing an employee handbook or changing the employee handbook or enforcing something that's in the employee handbook uh, or having a conversation with a staff member, you know, that, that becomes a team discussion with my wife and our, our taproom manager, you know, and that, that's also hugely important to have multiple points of view on it. Cause there's times where I've wanted to push a certain direction and they've had to say, no, like this will affect our culture negatively. If you push this way, if you enforce this too harshly or talk about this with that attitude towards it. And so I think having, we have a pretty diverse, you know, set of, uh, of personalities in that leadership group. Uh, and so it's been really developing that level of trust between the three of us that like, if I say something that I think is a bad idea or they think is a bad idea, they're, they're going to tell me. Um, and I, I really appreciate that we have that trust and that level of camaraderie here, but yeah, it, it's, it's really tough. It's not, we don't, we try not to take for granted our employees. We try to, you know, give them opportunities to also have fun and enjoy what they're doing. Um, but it, it's tough to find time and, and money and resources and all the all the pieces of the puzzle to to keep that keep that going. Um, so yeah, it, it's we're still adjusting. Again, I think I learned so much from Allagash, not only from the brewing side, but also from how the company was run. I was actually hired. I was employee number 45 at Allagash because they gave us numbered sweatshirts for some reason. But employee, <laughs> employee number 46 was their first HR manager. And so we actually got to do onboarding together. We actually went to the same small college in Vermont and developed kind of a, a friendship. Um, and she's come out to the brewery a number of times. Her son's actually going to college out here in Denver. And like having a relationship with someone who is an HR manager at a company like Allagash that really, really takes care of their employees and treats people really well. I mean, they had, they just had two brewers leave who had been their friends of mine for 13 and 15 years, respectively. And like, that's, you don't, no one stays at a company that long unless there is a good company culture at the core of it. Um, and so I think I've, I've also been observing and trying to learn about that side of things, whether I knew it or not, I think as I was in my brewing career. Um, and so it's been a, part of what we've had to implement here. And I understand how important it is and how quickly it can all fall apart. So we really try to put time and emphasis towards it, but it, it can be difficult for sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things like any relationship that just takes a lot of time, communication and good intent. Um, yeah. Hey, it's time to wrap things up here, buddy, but I've, uh, I've loved um, getting to know you and chatting like this. Um, when is our collaboration gonna happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I need to make it to Ohio at some point. It's uh, one of my good friends. Uh, they own Primitive Beer, and we have their beer on tap all the time. 
she's from Ohio and keeps, uh, she's like, I think we should go, we take trips together all the time. We've been to Czech, uh, Vienna, um, Belgium together. So we've traveled a lot and she keeps trying to put Ohio on the list. So maybe oh, it'll there you actually go. happen right. one of these days. Don't come for the skiing, but, uh, you can come <laughs> for the beer. Yeah. Um, anyway, I mean, this, was, this has been great, Eric. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I really appreciate you reaching out and, and yeah, taking a kind of leap of faith with somebody you didn't know. And I, I uh, always enjoy talking beer. So happy to talk about beer, whether it's on a podcast or not. So, um, yeah, it's been great, great chatting and just sharing my story with you. So thanks for the opportunity. hundred percent. Yeah. So Eric's going to be back on the next episode of this show as the host, he will have a conversation with a brewer of his choosing that will be on the air in about two weeks. So make sure you tune in for that. Visit allaboutbeer.com and follow on social media. And to support beer journalism in the beer space, check out patreon.com slash allaboutbeer. I'm Sean Yasaki of Noble Beast Brewing. Thank you for listening to the Brewer to Brewer podcast. This episode was brought to you by First Tea. First Tea delivers the ingredients and experience brewers need for delicious beers and innovative flavors. Flexible order sizes and direct from farm teas for your next brew. Find out more about First Tea by visiting blog.firsttea.com. That's blog.firsttea.com.